Genesis 27. And um, it says there, Now it came to pass when Isaac was old, his eyes were so dim that he could not see, that he called Esau his older son, the promogenitor, and said to him, my son, and he answered him, here I am. Then he said, behold now, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver, your bow, and go out into the field and hunt game for me and make me savory food such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat and my soul may bless you before I die. And so <clears throat> some time has lapsed. We know at the end of chapter 26 that Esau is 40 years old. And remember, Isaac was 60 when Esau and Jacob were born. So that would make Isaac, if it, there was no time lapse, that would make Isaac 100 years old. That would make his boys, Esau and Jacob, 40 at this time. However, there's some very complicated um, equations put together, looking at every verse of the age of people going all the way to Joseph, <laughs> and people then calculate it out from there. But in every situation, you have to make some presumptions. Now, Martin Luther did that, and he believed that Isaac was 137 at this time. Now, if that were the case, that would make Jacob and Esau 77. I don't think that's the case. I just don't think they were that old. Now, the pulpit commentary uses a lot of the same verses that Martin Luther did, but they come up with 117 years old. That would make the boys 57. And I, I, I think that is probably the right one. But again... Uh, We've all taught this in Sunday school, if you've been a Sunday school teacher, and uh, Jacob's the good little teenage boy, right? Esau's the teenage boy, the guy in his early 20s running out to hunt. But we know for sure from the last chapter, they're at least 40. And if, if Isaac was 117, that would make him 57 at the time, which seems to, to be the occasion. So you got to sort of recalculate your brain, Right? Um, we don't have a couple little boys here being bossed around by mom and dad. We've got a couple of very grown men. Matter of fact, Esau has, with his two Canaanite wives, probably has several grandchildren at, by this time. We do know the boys were 15 years old when Abraham died, so they got to know Father Abraham a little bit. And um, he now is, is feeling like I am on the verge of death. That's the way Isaac's feeling. Now, just to let you know, he lives to be 180. Okay? So if he's 100 years old, he's 80 years away from dying. That's a long time to live thinking you're dying every day. You know? If he's 117, well, you can do the math. Um, he's got a long ways before he dies, but he is quite confident that it's near. But it was not near. But part of it was the quality of his life was severely handicapped by this eye problem that he had, where he was near blind, if not completely blind. It's interesting, his son Jacob later, uh, in his later years, would also go blind. So, you know, maybe it's something uh, in the family <laughs> that uh, is causing a bad eye disease. I, I don't know. But... Let's do take a note that Isaac's blind. So while this chapter goes on, Jacob and Rebekah are, are playing tricks on a blind guy. That's just not a very honorable thing to do, right? Um, I, I had a, a blind uh, schoolmate in, in college, and guys constantly did horrible things to him because he was blind, you know, from making his walking stick shorter to putting weird stuff on his plate while he was eating. To, uh, they signed him up for the Playboy magazine. Um, that was, those guys were, you know, not, not uh, doing very well at all in the Lord. But um, 
Let's do let's keep that in mind. But Esau is saying here, I want to do this. He says the end of verse before, before I die. You know, I think a part of the reason of this is we don't have a moment where Abraham clearly passed the blessing on to Isaac. We saw in the earlier chapter that Abraham died, and it says, and after Abraham died, God blessed Isaac. It seems that Abraham talked about it to Isaac, of the blessing that would come to him, but it doesn't seem like there's a really moment in time. You know, dads, that's, that's a big part of our job, is to create moments in time. I, I hope that's a truck and not a bomb. Um, we've got 30 seconds to go that way, or... Okay, there we go. So, um, to create moments in time, you know, whether that's a mill at night, to create a moment they don't forget. If you got a week's vacation, create a couple of moments in time that they won't forget. I know my kids, they've all told me that the thing that stick out to them most was our family devotions that we had. And of course, hopefully they all have a moment in time of conversation with just mom and, or dad and child, or mom and child. I hope that we created a moment. But Abraham did not do that. And Isaac doesn't have that moment in time. Now Jacob, he goes way to the other degree. He has each of the boys come and put their hand under his thigh and so forth. Remember, Abraham did that to his servant when he went to go get a, a bride for Isaac. Put your hand under my thigh and, and swear to me that you would do this. So Eli Eliezer, the, the servant, had a moment in time with Abraham, but it doesn't appear that, that Isaac did. And I'll tell you, I think Ishmael did. I think Ishmael had some really special moments with Abraham. And remember Abraham's, when God said, no, he's not the, Ishmael's not the one, he's like, no, let Ishmael live before me. You know, I want it to be him. But it wasn't the firstborn son, it was the secondborn son. Later with Jacob, it wouldn't be his firstborn son, Reuben, it would be one of the younger sons. King David, it wasn't any of his older brothers. Uh, it was the tiny, young, ruddy-looking guy that did not look kingly like his big, strong brothers. He was the runt in the family. But God doesn't look on the outward man. God looks upon the heart. And so we, we see that Isaac is saying, you're the older son, you're the oldest son, and before I die... Um, I, I want to create a moment, and I want it to be a special meal that me and you share. I want it to be a special Thanksgiving meal, so to speak. And it's a fresh kill that you had, and that's going to be cool, you know, to tell me about the hunt. Tell me about what happened and, and how you tracked him down and how you brought him back and how you prepared him. He was wanting to. Now, we just saw in chapter 25 that Isaac loved Esau, and Rebekah loved Jacob. This was a divided family. But the thing is that's going to come clear in this chapter is that Isaac couldn't stand Jacob. And Rebekah, we already had a sense of that in the last chapter, the very last verse, where it says her and Isaac both, but in particular her, was grieved of mind over um, the fact that he had married these foreign gals, these Canaanite women. Um, it really, really, the Hittite women, it really bummed them out. And so Rebecca really didn't like Esau. We're going to find that here. And Jacob really did not, or Isaac did not like Jacob. And uh, so this was a divided family. When you start being divided, you become more divided. When you're hurt over something, the hurts will grow. If you're bitter at something, the bitterness will grow. And if you're a little bit divided, it won't be long until you have a big division. And, uh, you know, Jesus said it plainly in, in Matthew 3, 24 and 25, right? A kingdom, against, can't, a kingdom divided against itself can't stand. But he said very clearly, a house divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And we, you know what we're going to find out here? Rebecca is going to get all clever and manipulate Isaac, or manipulate Jacob and deceive Isaac. But 
and doing this, causing even a greater divide in the house, she will never see Jacob again. She literally, through deception, is going to do a permanent division. She'll still be around Isaac and Esau, which she can't stand. But her son Jacob, that she loves, she'll never see him again. A lot of hurt there. Now, Isaac, no doubt, remembers the prophecy that came from Rebekah when she was pregnant. She tells her husband, something's not right here. And he says, seek the Lord. And she seeks the Lord. And, and God gives her a prophecy. Remember that in Genesis 25, 23? And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other. And the older shall serve the younger. The older shall serve the younger. So one's going to be stronger. That would be Esau, right? If you're thinking individually, he was the strong, hairy guy. But if you're thinking of nations, then Jacob was the stronger, and that Israel became a greater, stronger nation. But no doubt about this, the older will serve the younger. And it's interesting that Jacob, right from the womb, tried to change that, didn't he? <laughs> he had a hold of Esau's hill, and, and the understanding is he was a surplanter. He was trying to pull Esau, climb over the top of him, and be the first out. There was a competition going on uh, even in the womb. And so Esau, if you would, won the first battle. But we're going to find out in a minute Isaac clearly knew this prophecy, and he is not going to honor it. He is basically saying, we're going to solve this issue now, even though I don't believe it's God's will, I'm going to do it anyway, because that's my will, and I want my will to be the will that uh, happens here. So he's in rebellion. He's not in a good place spiritually. But also the story where Esau says, give me some food or I die. <laughs> and Jacob's like, well, I'm not going to give you any food. Boy, we see the division there, don't we? I mean, usually if your brother says, I'm dying, I'm starving to death, you're like, hey, let me get you some food. Here, what you want to drink? Not the case here. Jacob's like, yeah, I got all the food. I'm not giving you any. And, and uh, he says, sell me your birthright and I'll give you some stew. And he does. That story is very clear. So Esau really gave up his birthright, and in the culture of this day, his word was his bond. And so it was a done deal, something that even the parents uh, would have to honor. But it didn't seem like Isaac took it seriously. Uh, he's like, oh, whatever you boys do, I don't care. It doesn't matter. So Isaac is in, a, in sort of a state of rebellion here himself. Now, verse 5. Now, Rebecca was listening, or we also call that eavesdropping. We're going to find that more than one time in this chapter. She happens to hear a conversation Isaac had. Hmm. So, again, this place is divided, and they're, they're, they're not trusting each other, and they're both having to um, keep tabs on what the other guy's doing because they might hurt me if I don't pay attention here. And this is what she's thinking. Hey. They're having a conversation. I didn't know what's going on. And she's listening, and she heard Isaac speak this to Esau, his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt the game and bring it back. Now, verse 6, Rebecca, Rebecca spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game and make the savory food for me that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, you didn't say, what you doing back there, man? He did not say all of that. Um, but again, I, maybe it was assumed. So she's, she's uh, not wrong necessarily, um, but it, it's interesting, we're going to see the two times that, that Isaac blesses Jacob, and one did, did not seem so spiritual. But she's thinking this is a spiritual blessing she's going to put on Esau. That He's not supposed to be on Esau, it's supposed to be on you, Jacob. And in verse 8, Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. 
You see, here's some bad parenting. (laughs) I'm going to tell you to obey me so we both disobey God. I'm going to tell you to have bad character. Now do what I say and, and become a deceptive person. And deceive your old blind dad. That's the plan. And then you better obey me. Boy, there's a lot of parenting teachings that can be here of what not to do. But um, it's interesting that I don't think this is an isolated situation. Because at the end of this chapter, she's going to say, go home to my brother Laban. And we know what a shyster he was. And evidently, she was a shyster as well. And no doubt, this was a big part of of why the marriage problems were going on and the kids had such little character. Um, And so obey me. Don't obey God. Obey me. Go now to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats, and I will make savory food from them for your father such as he loves. We've been married for 40, 50 years now. I know exactly what he likes. Then you shall take it to your father, that he may eat it, that he may bless you before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Look, Esau, my brother, is the hairy man, and I am smooth-skinned man. So evidently, they were fraternal twins, and not identical twins, right? Esau means hairy. He came out of the womb hairy, and it doesn't sound like he's ever um, gotten past that. <laughs> And uh, so that's pretty severe how hairy he was, but I'm not the hairy guy, Um, quite the opposite. And then he goes on to say in verse 12, perhaps my father will fill me and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him and I shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. That's all that Jacob was concerned about. He wasn't concerned about what he's doing is wrong. <laughs> it's, it's just absolutely deceptive. Maybe, again, both of them are thinking, hey, yeah, that's right. Esau sold it to me. That's mine. Dad shouldn't be giving that to him. And dad knows the story. He knows that Esau sold it to me. That's mine. And, of course, Rebecca's going, yeah, it's yours. I mean, God prophesied, told me before you guys were ever born. That's supposed to not be that way. The older is going to serve the younger. You're supposed to get the blessing. So maybe they rationalized it. You know, they, and again, uh, it tells us in, in Romans that we have a conscience. And that conscience can excuse or accuse. And I think the conscience is starting to get there. But that's not what's happening. It's, I'm not afraid that I'm sinning before God. I'm afraid I might get caught. That's a very different thing, isn't it? And that's all he's afraid of, is the deception may come short and they may not be able to pull it off. But his mother had already thought through this. Remember, she didn't say, go get me a goat. She said, go get me two baby goats. Baby goats have very fine, thin hair, almost feeling human. And, And notice, she already thought about this. And his mother said to him, well, let your curse be on me and my, my son. Only obey my voice and go get them for me. So again, it sounds sort of like he's reluctant. It sounds like he's like, nah, mom, this, you know, no, I, what if I get caught? No, 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 no. But she's like double downing. No, 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 you're going to obey me. Mom, I'm 57 years old. Don't you 57-year-old me that. You get out there and, you know, I don't know. My, my mom, when I'm around here, she's still that, oh, make sure you eat all that. Make sure you, you know, I'm like, mom, I'm 62 years old. Quit telling me what to do. Parents can't stop being parents. I don't know. I hope I'm not going to be that way. Anyway, verse 14, and he went and got them and brought them to his mother and his mother made savory food such as his father loved. And now, notice here, Rebecca took the choice clothes of his old of the elder son Esau. So maybe his wedding garments or his celebration garments. Um, you know, they they happen to be in the house t- being taken care of. It sounds like Dad sort of lives out in his own tent, maybe in a little more rustic of a situation. And uh, so Esau's nice clothes are, are in the house with Mom. And so she takes these choice clothes of Esau's, which were with her in the house. 
and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And then notice she put the skins of the kids of the goats, these baby goats, on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. (laughs) So he had a hairy neck too. And she gave the savory food and bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son, Jacob. And he went to his father and said, my father. And notice immediately, Isaac is suspect. Now what happens when your eyes go? Your hearing becomes more acute, your smell, your taste becomes more acute. And so uh, I know me and my brother, we're a couple of years apart, but our voices sound very, very similar. And, and people often uh, make note of that. And so these guys are twins. They probably had similar voices, but the dad can tell them apart, and he did. He said, here I am. Who are you, my son? Hmm, I, I'm already questioning Number one, it seems a little quick. And two, it sounds more like Jacob than Esau. But Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise, sit and eat of my game. So it sounds like he was laying down, maybe not, again, a healthy person. But eat of my game that your soul may be blessed. And Isaac said to his son, How is it that you found it so quickly, my son? And then Jacob really starts to get deceptive, blasphemously so. He said, because the Lord, Yahweh, your God, brought it to me. That's an interesting phrase, your God. I I wonder, one, if he had said, my God, maybe that would have been dead giveaway. (laughs) It wasn't Esau, because Esau did not have an appetite for God. So if he said, the Lord my God, oh, now I know you're Jacob. Or, as we're going to see in the next couple of chapters, it doesn't appear Jacob had a relationship with God either. And so they knew their dad did, but it doesn't seem that maybe they did. They didn't say the Lord, my God, but your God has blessed me. And Isaac said to Jacob, please come near that I may fill you, my son, whether you really my son Esau or not. So he totally thinking this is something that Jacob would do. These guys, he's on guard. He knows how deceptive they are. He's pretty sure that this whole thing is a con, is a setup. His instincts are telling him that. His ears are telling him that. Everything is telling him something is not right. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, hmm, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. So he really was one hairy dude. And he did not recognize him because of his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. And he said, I'm going to ask you one more time. Are you really my son Esau? So he is totally sensing it. From the minute Jacob said, hey, dad, to all the way to the end of this conversation, he is constantly doubting whether this is really Esau or not. And he said, I am. And he said, bring it near to me and I will eat of my son's game so that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank Then his father Isaac said to him, come near now and kiss me, my son. So I think he's getting another fit as well, maybe at that hairy neck this time. (laughs) And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his clothing and blessed him and said. So because he has his Esau's clothes on, he has the smell, uh, you know, B.O., if you would, of Esau. Uh, and it's a very distinct um, smell of the, of the ground and of the woods and, and of the hunter. And so he said, surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field, which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, may God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren 
and let your mother's sons bow down to you. <laughs> so how divided is his family? He's like, man, yeah, your mother's son and his kids and his great grandkids, everybody from Jacob, bow down to you, Esau. I mean, he really doesn't like Jacob. Not just you, but all his kids and his kids after them. All, everybody from your mother's son, bow down to you. Curse be everyone who curses you and blessed be those who bless you. That final line is really the only line of the promise God gave to Abraham that Abraham was to give to Isaac and Isaac was to give to his son. So as I, I listen to this, it sounds very earthly. It sounds very secular. It doesn't have the same spiritual sense that we get when a man is in the spirit. And so take a note, because after this whole thing happens, Isaac finally wakes up and realizes Jacob's had to get out of here. Esau's going to kill him. And he realizes, I've been out of the will of God. Jacob, I really do want to bless you. And he does in the next chapter. I have it there in your notes. Look, look at Genesis 28. We're going to look at this again this week in verse 3 and 4. May, this is the blessing Isaac puts on Jacob before he sends him off. He says, may God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you, that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. Wow. Didn't that sound spiritual? The other one sounds almost bitter. Yeah, you're a man of the earth and the earth is yours, you know. You're a man of the sky. It's yours too. And as far as that brother of yours, may you subdue him and every nation. They all would be subservient to you, especially your mother's son and his sons after him. And, and uh, okay, I didn't do any of the Abraham stuff. And nobody curses you, be cursed, blessed, be, you know. He finally throws in a little bit of it, but it's a very carnal blessing. It really is, even though it's thorough. Again, God is gracious, isn't he? I don't know if God's referring to the blessing here that he gave Jacob or the blessing in the next chapter, but here's all that God says about Isaac in the hall of faith. One tiny little line. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Again, Isaac doesn't take up a lot of space in Genesis. He's the son of Abraham or the father of Jacob. And very little has been said about him. And we see why. He's sort of a, a, a pathetic person. Even though he, there was a moment there in chapter 22 when he willingly laid himself on the altar in obedience to the father, such a picture of the father giving his son Jesus. And of course, he's in the field meditating. And he gets his wife. That was special. But outside of that, we really don't um, see anything, you know? And, and, the, and the little bits we see is him really resisting the will of God, angry at his wife, angry at Jacob, really doesn't like them at all. And it goes on to say here in verse 30, now it happened, as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. <clears throat> so, man, this makes a great play, doesn't it? As one part of the tent flap is shutting on Jacob's butt, Esau is coming in going, somebody here? And he walks in. Boy, you know, the suspense is, is you there for a moment, Right? What if Esau had gotten there just 30 seconds earlier and, uh, and, and saw him dressed in his finest clothes and having hair pasted on his body? That would have been rather strange. I think uh, there might have been a battle going on right in the moment. But in verse 31, he also had made savory food and brought it to his father and said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game 
that your soul may be may bless me. Go ahead. Shut this one off. Okay, there we go. So Esau comes in and hands the food to his dad and says, Okay, bless me, dad. And his father Isaac said to him, Who are you? And he said, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. And Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, Who? Can you take the echo out there, Josh? Josh is like, I'm, I'm the video guy. Why am I having to do the sound? But thank you for doing the sound. Talk. Okay, there we go. So in verse 32, and his father Isaac said to him, who are you? And he said, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac trembled exceedingly. Boy, all the commentaries have a lot to say on that expression. He trembled exceedingly. Some say that he was angry because he should have went with what he sensed. Others say, matter of fact, most commentators say, the heavy hand of God came on him, going, my will, not your will, be done, Isaac. In other words, it was just a great moment of conviction. Now, you, you maybe ask the question at this point, well, what if... Rebecca and Jacob didn't come up with this scheme. Would have Isaac blessed Esau? And I'll tell you, no. Well, how would have this story gone? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I've seen in the Bible where, you know, uh, Balaam wanted to talk. And God caused his donkey to see what he couldn't see. And he saw an angel with a sword getting ready to kill him. And the donkey saved his life. I think of John the Baptist's dad. His, he said, yeah, your, your wife's going to have a baby. It's impossible. And he's sitting there arguing with the angel. No, it's not impossible. Yeah, old women can't have kids. Everybody knows that. Uh, Abraham, Father Abraham, you're a priest. You should know that story, you know. And, and you're going to name him John. No, 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 enough. Even if she had a kid, which I don't think is possible, I'm definitely going to name him John. And God's like, you're not going to talk again <laughs> until you name him John. God could have done that. Hey, you think you can't see, Isaac. Um, now you can't talk on top of that. God, God could have done it in a million, infinite amount of different ways. But I think they would have saw the hand of God in an encouraging way. Galatians 3.3 is clear, isn't it? Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you going to made, be made perfect by the flesh? And so, again here, I, I just think that they didn't have to do this in their flesh. But at this moment, I think what most commentaries say is that Isaac was overcome with the heavy hand of God upon him. But he said, who? Where's the one who hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate all of it before you came, and I have blessed him. And indeed, he shall be blessed. Can't be undone. The words have been spoken, the blessing's been given, and it's a really a something. It's not a, it's not a nothing. Often in our culture, when we speak words, they often don't really mean anything. You don't really plan on it. It's not a certainty. But in this culture, a word, a promise, a covenant, it was a something. Literally, you couldn't see it and touch it, but it was a something. And the blessing that I gave to Jacob, that something is on him now. And it isn't available any longer to give it to you. But then Esau heard the words his father. He cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, bless me also, my father. And he said, Your brother came 
with deceit, and he has taken away your blessing. Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob, <laughs> deceiver, hill catcher, surplanter? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. Not true. He did not. He could have starved to death and died, <laughs> according to Esau. But he clearly did not have to sell it. They, they made a deal. So he, even though it was a really shady deal, because his brother needed food, why didn't you just give him food without making him pay for it? I, I agree, it was not an a honorable situation, but he didn't take it. Esau willingly sold it, because he, he saw no value in it. And now look, he has taken away my blessing. Not really. Because the blessing was always Jacob's. Before they were born, when they were still in the womb, the blessing had always been Jacob's. Even though Esau was born first, it was never his. But unfortunately, it sure looks that way. It looks like the human arm of the flesh did this. And you don't see the divine hand of God. Why? Because in their flesh, in the energies of flesh, in their arm of their flesh, they, they produce this thing. And it happened to be what God said he was going to do anyway. But now God doesn't, is not going to do it his supernatural, beautiful way. It's going to get done by their fleshly, ugly way. <laughs> yeah, you got, where, you got from point A to point B, but with a bad taste in your mouth. The Bible says when the Lord gives to you, there's no sorrow with it in the Proverbs. And here God gave to them, but there was sorrow with it because they did it by the work of their flesh. I think of Elijah when the, 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 they had a contest with the Babylon or the, the bell worshipers and they were in a call fire out of heaven. Remember that? And the bell worshipers tried and couldn't do it. And then it, Elijah said, get all the water and just start dumping it on this sacrifice. Why? Because he didn't want a freak human spark. He didn't want anybody to be able to say, well, yeah, yeah there was a fire, but you know, I, don't, I can't really say it's of God. Elijah was like, it's going to be a work of God or nothing at all. It's going to be a pure hand of God, fire from heaven consuming the sacrifice or nothing at all. And boy, that is the right place to be. To say, Lord, I want to see you do it. Your hand, not my cleverness, not my abilities in the flesh to try to do your will by the flesh, to perfect in the flesh what God's doing by his spirit. So it does look that way, that as the arm of man, the arm of a deceiver, stole his blessing. But again, I think had Isaac tried to bless Esau with Jacob's blessing, we would have saw the mighty hand of God. And then he goes on after he cried and said, bless me also. Okay, um, he took my birthright. He took my blessing. And then he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? So, you know what? All is not lost. Because the blessing you were going to put on Jacob, the lesser blessing, the secondary blessing, just take that blessing and give me that blessing. But Isaac answered and said to Esau, Indeed, I have made him your master, and all his brethren I have given to him as a servant with grain and wine and sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? Take a note. Isaac really despised Jacob. He was going to give all the blessing to Esau, nothing left over for Jacob. Not a morsel. And he said, man, the blessing I was putting on you, Esau, that ended up on Jacob, it was A to Z, and there was nothing left, not any scraps for anybody else. Boy, Isaac really didn't like Jacob. But now um, he ended up cursing Esau the way uh, he was trying to curse Jacob. And Esau said to his father, have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me also, and my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And we know that verse in Hebrews 12, 17. 
For you know afterwards what he wanted to inherit the blessing. He was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Repentance is when you have a change of mind towards not your way, but God's way. Not my will anymore, but God's will now. And Esau wanted a blessing, not the spiritual blessing. He wanted the material blessing. And if you go back and look at what Isaac said, it was a very materialistic blessing. You're going to have power and you're going to go out into the fields and you're going to, have a, you're going to be this great farmer. You're going to be, have all these great things and everybody's going to come to you. You're going to be the head over all nations and even your brothers and all his descendants. You're going to be over them all. It was a very earthly, secular want he had. But for him to truly have a godly repentance where he's like, I'm broken right now because I realize I've been wanting my will and not God's will. I realize at this point I haven't had a humble heart of dependence upon God. I've been self-willed, self-driven, I'm a man's man. I can go kill what I need and I can go conquer what I need. And, 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 I, and I realize that I'm not under the spout where the blessings flow out. I'm not in God's will. So even though we see all this weeping, it's not a godly sorrow that God can accept. And then he, he says, come on, there's got to be something. So Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven above. Now, notice the word of the fatness of the earth and of the dew of the heaven. Most translations do not have it in the positive as it is here. They have it in the negative. And even if you look in the Strong's, it says right there, as most translations have it, away from, away from the blessings of the fatness of the earth, away from the dew of the heaven from above. And so virtually everybody believes this not to be a positive blessing, but a negative. And it's actually speaking in contrast to what was said earlier. Remember going back there to verse uh, 28? The blessing was, therefore may God give you all the dew of the heaven, all the fatness of the earth. But now Isaac is saying the opposite is going to happen for you. In contrast, the opposite. It should be there in a negative. You are no longer going to be the man who has the fatness of the earth like you've had in the past. You're no longer going to get the blessings from heaven above that you've experienced in the past. And indeed, we do know this, guys, that the Edomites ended up in the country of Jordan today in a place, Rock City, called Petra. I've been there, and it is just, they're living in the rocks like an animal. They, they don't have pastures. They don't have fields. Um, they, they made their life as as a cave people, a rock people. They lived in the, the caves and the rocks. They didn't flourish uh, in, the, in the lands as farmers. They didn't flourish in the lands as shepherds at all. They lived in the caves, in the rocks. But he does say this in verse 40, but your sword, by your sword you shall live and you shall serve your brother. And it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. Again, this is exactly what happened. You can read it in Major Prophets, the Minor Prophets, the whole book of Obadiah says that basically the Edomites were constantly angry with Israel because they were just jealous. And they believed that the blessings that Israel was receiving should have been their blessings. And, and again, Edomite, the reason they were called Edomite is over that red stew. When, when Jacob sold, uh, got Esau to sell his birthright over that red stew, that's what they're named after. They're named after a very bitter moment. That's the whole name of their country. 
And that bitterness came through. As we're going to find out, not Esau himself. He forgave Jacob. But it, indeed, it did um, decimate their, their lineage down the line. In Obadiah 1.10, For violence against your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. So, as the earlier blessing, curse everyone who curses you, they were cursed. Well, finishing up here in verse 41 now. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning of my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. So after dad dies, which is going to be any day now, <laughs> and it being years and years away, um, but when he dies and, and, the, and, you know, the grieving time is over, then I'm going to kill Jacob. And the words of Esau, her, um, and the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. She had her spies out. And she sinned and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Surely your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you by intending to kill you. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice. Now, have we heard this before? Arise and flee to your brother Laban in Haran. I'm gonna, my influence hasn't been bad enough on you as a, as a total shyster, but I'm going to send you to the school of shysterism. Uh, if you haven't learned how to be a deviant person yet, you will learn it under my brother Laban. Not a very good plan. But he goes on in verse 44, but stay with him just a few days <laughs> until your brother's fury turns away. End up being decades. At one point, Jacob says to Laban, I've served you for 20 years, but it was a lot more because he was there before, he lived there quite, quite a while before he ever started serving Laban. And then he lived there for a long time afterwards, not serving Laban, but had his own company going, if you would. But um, he basically was gone. And, and of course, she had no idea that what she had just done was destroy her family. She would never see her favorite son, Jacob, ever again. Nor would Jacob ever see her. The family was split. Jacob and Esau would live completely separately. At, at this day, the family is shattered. It is completely destroyed. Well, stay with him a few days until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you. The word fury in verse 44 is also the word heat or hot. So till your brother's heat cools down. And then the word anger in verse 45 is the word nose or nostrils with the understanding like when a bull gets mad and starts snorting. So these are the two words, very descriptive. Wait till his heat <laughs> cools off, until his snorting calms down and the bull is calmed down. He quits blowing snot in the heat of the moment, turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereave also of both in one day? And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. For if Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heth, like these who are of the daughters of the land, what good is my life to me? So she, she goes out to Isaac, and instead of just saying, hey, I think Jacob ought to leave for a while, she, again, has got to go into this dramatic moment. You know, if Jacob does what I, you know, and he's like, oh, okay, okay, okay. I, I think at this point, Isaac has been whipped years earlier by his wife, and uh, she knows how to manipulate him into whatever she wants. And that's where the chapter ends, saying, hey, we, we know this would not be good for Jacob to marry one of these Hittite women or Canaanite women or Philistine women. Um, we need to do for him what your dad did for you, Isaac. And Isaac's like, yep, you're absolutely right. Any questions tonight? Yes. So I was wondering, you said the verse 39, would, it, would Isaac have uh, said it if uh, Esau would not pursue him? It's just an absence of blessing. 
That's a good question. Yeah, it seems like he wanted something to, he wanted his dad to say something and what his dad said wasn't good. So yeah, I, I, do, I do think when Isaac is now praying for Esau, he is prophesying. He senses God's presence and he's speaking, going, this is, this is your future. Um, and I do believe that the Lord spoke through Isaac to Esau there. I don't think the Lord spoke on the blessing over Jacob there in that chapter, but the next chapter, I think he really does pray a blessing. And all God can say in Hebrews about it is, well, by faith, Isaac, he sort of prayed a prayer uh, over Jacob and Esau. <laughs> That's about all he can say. Yeah. No, no, there, there, there is a few. Um, I have a list of them in my notes. I don't have them here, well, but. Yeah, you, you would actually have to have studied a bit of Hebrew or, or had somebody read a commentary where somebody had studied Hebrew to get that. But, um, the Greek Septuagint is also, a lot of people will study that as well. And a lot of times the Greek Septuagint will be clearer than the Hebrew. And I think that's why most of the commentators say in the Greek Septuagint, it is clear, it's a negative. For me, it's the context of the chapter. Because he's saying almost the same thing that he said in verse 28, and, and now he's flipping it. And uh, so... There, I think there's five translations that translate in the positive, and all the rest of them have it in the negative. They actually say, no dew from heaven for you. No blessings, fatness of the earth, the fertility of the earth for you. It actually says the word no. And then, um, but most of them say away from you. And in the Strong's Concordance, if you were studying that out, you just went to a concordance and looked it up, it actually translates as away from the dew of the heaven, away from the blessings of the earth. And you'd say, why is that? And then if you just read strong, it'll tell you why, that this could be positive or it could be negative. Depends on how, which way you want to look at it. And again, from the chapter context, it seems like he, he it seems two things. You know, one, we see how much Isaac didn't like Jacob. Like, I, I was going to curse you, man. I wasn't just going to bless Esau. I was going to curse you. But God stopped that. And instead, he switched it. Yeah. Yes. You said chapter 28? Yes. Okay, we're going to look at that next week. But, okay. yeah, so he, he thought... I, I'm, you know, I mean, by now he's been met, married to these Hittite women for years and their kids and all of it grieves Rebecca. So she doesn't like his wife that he married. She doesn't probably like the kids and the way they're living like a bunch of pagans. She, it just, the whole thing is just grievous to her. And now she's lost Jacob. So Esau's trying to get the relationship a little better. So he marries... No, no, it shows you how ignorant Esau was of spiritual things. He had no concept of spiritual things. But you also see they had no relationship. He didn't say, Mom, forgive me for marrying the Hittite woman. How can I bless you? He didn't ask the question. Hey, Dad, how can I be more blessed? And, well, you know, why is Jacob there? Because this is what Abraham did for Isaac. And, but again, Esau had no desire for spiritual things. He didn't even have the ability to ask the questions. So he tried to please his mother, but, it, you know, so he married some relatives. Oh, you, you, Jacob went to marry some relatives, some first, second cousins. Well, I'll marry some first or second cousins, too, of Ishmael. And for him, that was identical. <laughs> yeah, wasn't, it wasn't solving anything. Yes. Other question? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, but not in the pagan cultures probably in, in this case. Yeah, Esau was a man's man. He did what he want. He was, he was a secular, self-willed guy, and he just went and worked it all out and came home with a couple of wives and thought his parents would love it. <laughs> and they were completely grieved, and he had no idea why. And I don't think he ever did get it. Yeah. Good stuff. Good questions. Well, I think we got to come back and just ask the question, you know, are we aware of spiritual blessings that God has for us? Are we willing to ask them? You know, I, I've been meditating a lot on that prayer of Jabez, you know, and his name meant pain. <laughs> and he was living that. He was cursing himself and cursing other people. But something happened in his life. He, had, he got spiritually aware all of a sudden. And it says that he became honorable more than his brothers. And he simply prayed and said, Lord, my mom prophesied it, and it seems to be the truth in my life. I'm a pain, but Lord, number one, bless me indeed. I, I wanted to be clear that it's not a man, it's not me, it's not money, it's not prestige, it's not somebody else, it's you, that your blessings are coming to me. And secondly, my sphere, my tense would be expanded, my sphere would be greater that that it would be evident your blessing is causing a blessing to spread to others. And that sphere of your blessing is blessing others. The father Abraham, right? I'll bless you and I'll make you a blessing. This is what he's asking. So bless me and then let that blessing, the sphere of who I bless grow. And then the next thing is that your hand would be upon me. I love that. I, I want to walk in the spirit. I want to sense my dad's hand on my shoulder. Turn me to the left. Turn me to the right. Stop me. Keep me. Your, your hand is so heavy upon me. And then keep me from evil that I don't cross pain. I mean, Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer, you know, that very same thing. Deliver us from evil or deliver us from the evil one. Hmm. Lord, let us be spiritually minded. So often we are only secular minded like Esau. So often we are just exactly like that, living like the world, except we go to church a couple of times and read a few verses here and there. And, and, uh, and today, of course, if we're conservative politically, we must be a good Christian. If we vote for the right person and the right things, then we must be right with God. Lord, we know that there is a walk in the spirit the supernatural gifts of the Spirit. You said to seek spiritual gifts, to desire them greatly, Lord, and especially that we might prophesy. But Lord, we ask that we'd pray in the Spirit, when our minds unfruitful. We'd pray, we'd sing in the Spirit when our minds unfruitful. As Paul said, I pray in tongues more than you all, that we would experience the gift of faith and the gift of healings. Lord, I pray that we would entertain angels and wouldn't be unaware of it. Lord, we know that you have great and mighty things that we know not of. You have things planned for us that we haven't even imagined. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has even entered in the heart of man. So Lord, we seek you. We cry out to you through Jesus now, <laughs> through the seed. We come to the seed, to Jesus our Heavenly Father in heaven, we come, Lord. And we weep and we cry, and our hearts are true repentance, Lord. We don't want to walk in the flesh. We want to walk in the Spirit. We don't want to grieve the Spirit. We want to rejoice the Spirit. We don't want to quench the Spirit. We want to be open to every spiritual gift, every spiritual insight, every spiritual blessing, Lord. We don't want to quench the Spirit. We don't want to limit you, Lord. Thy kingdom come, Lord, thy will be done. Do all that you desire here at our church. Do all that you desire in being a sphere to this Rossmore area. We ask for a revival. We ask for the souls of people that are not even thinking about you right now. That aren't thinking about spiritual things. Many used to, but they've now become Esau's. They've become secular with very little spiritual truth in their life. You said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Lord, we come poor, we come hungry and thirsty. Lord, fill us up. Hmm.